It's a pleasure to be back. Can you hear me? No, every, at, at, at my age, every time you come back, uh, year by year, why, it's wonderful. <laughs> I can't have any complaints. I hope you're well. I hope you're going to have a good morning. You are having a good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many friends, and uh, I hope I don't disappoint your friendship. Uh, you know, uh, I, I want to talk about the 19th century. My favorite century, actually, other than the current one. Uh, I don't have any choice about the current one, but I could choose out of many, many centuries, and the 19th century really speaks to me. Important things happen in the 19th century, really important ones, that we're still struggling with today. What am I doing? I'm going to address you, Dr. Law. There you go. Okay. Is that, that's all? Yeah. Oh, jeez. One inch makes a difference. <laughs> So, I, I, I say don't go there. <laughs> you know, the problems of the 19th century are the problems that we face today. The growth of science, tremendous growth of science, a, a revaluing of human life, a huge increase in the population, a, a tremendous sense that human life and human dignity and human individuality are no longer quite as important as they had been. 19th century has got wonderful music, it's got great thinkers. Uh, it's, um, it's a century in which for the first time in the history of humankind we have the sense that we control our destiny. Uh, in the Middle Ages and after there was no real sense that uh, human beings were in a position to take care of themselves and lead the kind of life that they wanted to lead. It was not a possibility. Uh, there were kings and noblemen. Uh, there were all kinds of people who defined what you could do, uh, what was expected of you. Uh, uh, but you didn't actually have control over your own life. Uh, you had no control over who ruled your life the king. You have no control. You had no control over the diseases that affected us. No control was the nature of human life. And people, of course, put up with it because there was no choice. The point of the French Revolution and the American Revolution, really one point to the two, and that is that rulers can be removed. That if we don't like what they do, we can get rid of them. And we got rid of them. Right? And, and, and established an altogether different sort of regime. That's a tremendous breakthrough in human life, in, human, in, in, in the power of human dignity, uh, so that we don't have to simply surrender our desires and our hopes, so that we can actually do something that makes a difference and we can live better. We can have political structures that we control, not I control, not you control, but we together control. Uh, we, have, uh, we, can have, we can have longer lives. Let me just give you one statistic. I don't have many statistics. In philosophy, you know, uh, a couple of facts go a long way. Uh, <laughs> there, are no, there are no reliable records of what the average lifespan was back in the 19th century, but we do have records from 1900. In 1900, the average lifespan was 46 years in this country, 46. Uh, right now, that's a little over 100 years later, we're talking about almost 80, 78 and something. So imagine where I would be if um, at 46 I would, on average, expire. A tremendous sense of control. Uh, a tremendous sense that we can do what we want to do. Right? And then we can live longer and that we can live better. And that we can live in a way that gives satisfaction to our lives instead of merely getting by. All right, so, so the, the, lots of great people who announced this. 
and, uh, and write about it, but none greater than the one I want to talk about today, and that's John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill lives in the smack dab in the middle of the 19th century. One book that he writes on liberty, which is without any question the greatest book on liberty ever written. On liberty is 1859, same year as Darwin. Uh, in, in a couple of years later, a couple of years later, he writes Utilitarianism, about eight, 1861. And uh, he is one of those philosophers who believes in actually doing something about his philosophy. And it's, it's, it's very sad when you've got people, as, as sometimes philosophers tend to be, who are abstracted from the world, who... Uh, uh, don't, who have all kinds of ideas as to how people should live, but never mind they're living that way. Right? Uh, John Stuart Mill is a guy who actually makes it count. So one of the things he did was run for parliament. Remarkable. Got elected one time. Uh, but what's really interesting is that he was, even as a politician, honest. This was as difficult to achieve in those days as it seems impossible now. Uh, at one point, he was making a speech uh, to a bunch of lower class folks. And one of them said, we heard you're of the opinion that we're a bunch of drunkards. And Mill said, I do think that because you are. <laughs> And the guy was taken aback. I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't believe it. He said, okay, this is the, this is the guy we ought to send to, uh, uh, to London. Uh, honest man and deeply concerned, interestingly enough, about two things that seem contradictory. On the one hand, the overall happiness of human beings. Deeply concerned about that. That's his utilitarianism. That means everybody on the same level, no one is to count for more than anybody else. No, that comes from his master Bentham who said, and this is a wonderful phrase, he said, when it comes to human beings, when it even comes to feeling beings, he said, each is to count for one and no one for more than one. That means no matter how fine you are as a human being, you're still one. Everybody counts. Everybody matters. Nobody can be excluded. That notion of no one can be excluded is absolutely magnificent. It's not always been with us. In fact, you, it, somebody wrote a book about how the history of humankind is the history of ex exclusion. And uh, that's not of women, of different religions, of different races. It's, it's a terrible history in one respect, but it's a wonderful history in some other respects. So Mill is deeply connected to everybody he wants everyone to do well, and I'll say more about that in a minute. But at the same time, he says every individual as an individual counts. And the individuality of people is what we have to, we absolutely must promote. Talk more about that in a minute also. Uh, you know, I, uh, the way I normally talk is, uh, it just keeps on going. Uh, <laughs> So, so would you, if you find that I'm not being clear about something, or you have a terribly important thing to say, would you just so indicate and, and just stop me? Because other than that, I'll, I'll go, as I always say my, to my classes, I'll just go on. <laughs> okay. So, so far, so good. So, let's talk first about utilitarianism. This is a great British tradition. It goes back to Hobbes. H-O-B-B-E-S, and even before Hobbes, and the idea behind it is that, uh, number one, the only thing that's good is pleasure. Now that sounds like it's a dirty kind of view, but it's not, don't, don't take it that way. Uh, pleasure just means human satisfaction. Satisfaction. So don't think of pleasure as, boy, I'm going to get my back scratched, and after that my head scratched, and after that who knows what. Uh, not, not that, not, not, not that kind of stuff. We're talking about uh, good feeling. The kind of feeling you get on a morning like this when you're outside and the sun is shining. Right? The kind of feeling you get when you say, you know, I think I understand what Mill had in mind. 
So it can be very physical, it can be also intellectual. It can be emotional when you see that your children are doing well. Right? The only thing that's of value is feeling, in other words, feeling. Sure, it's important to be rational. Sure, it's important to be with each other, but only important for one reason, because people get something out of it. What is the something they get out of it? Pleasure. Satisfaction. Good feeling. Okay? So don't take pleasure in its narrow sense. That's what, that's what uh, Bentham said. And by the way, I've got to tell you a story about Bentham. Bentham was a control freak. This was a a tremendously important philosopher who founded the University of London. And uh, he wasn't sure that he could uh, rely on the people that he put in charge to run the university the way he wanted. So uh, he said, when I die, you're going to embalm me. Put, put me in a chair, a wheelchair. <laughs> and every meeting of the Board of Trust, you're going to wheel me in. And, and, and put me at the head of the table, it's a true story, he, put me at the head of the table and I'm going to watch you suckers make the right decisions. <laughs> well, that's the kind. Now, Mill is not that kind of a uh, uh, of control freak. Uh, but Mill and but Bentham and others agree that what is necessary is a vast expansion of pleasure or good feeling or satisfaction or happiness. They even call it happiness among people. So if you want to be a moral individual, don't look to the kinds of intentions that you might have. Uh, you, know, the, you know the place to which the road is paved with good intentions. Good intentions don't matter. Good results do. It's all a matter of consequences. So whatever you do, for, for whatever you reason you do it, make sure that it brings good, satisfaction, happiness, pleasure for as many people as possible. This, I'm going to give you now the exact way in which Mill puts it in utilitarianism. He says, an action is right or has a tendency to be right on one condition, namely, that it produces the greatest amount of pleasure over pain for the largest number of people. The greatest amount of pleasure over pain for the large, greatest amount of happiness right, over unhappiness for the largest number of people. Let me, let me tell you what the over means. That means you do the best you can to figure out you know, how much happiness is going to be created by what I propose to do and deduct from it the unhappiness as though you could quantify this, because Mill really believed that you can quantify this. You quantify it and you say, let's say, all the pleasure, all the happiness I create by this action, minus all the unhappiness that will come from it, and whatever is left, right, so long as it's the highest possible value, is the right action. Okay? That, some eyes tell me that's not clear. <laughs> Shall I try it again? You know, I speak. Uh, let, me, let me try it this way. Suppose I got two options. Uh, option number one, uh, I can go to the movies with my wife and have a very pleasant time. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm not grading my uh, uh, exams. I'm supposed to grade my exams for my students, and they're very anxious about it. They, they think all of them will fail. And so I say, eh, I'm going to go and see the movies. Right? Action number one, possible action number one. Possible action number two, I will not go and see the movies. I'm going to grade these papers if they kill me. There's a fair chance they might. Uh, and I'm going to do it. Right? Now, now let, me, let me now try to calculate what will come out of it. Suppose I say I go to the movies. Well, there's immediate pleasure because I'm with my wife. Immediate pleasure because it's a good movie. Immediate pleasure because I am not grading the papers. <laughs> So there's a lot of immediate pleasure for me and my wife. All right, now the, the person who owns the movie theater is uh, very happy because we left a lot of money with him. Uh, he's charging more than he used to. Uh, uh, anybody else? Well, then there are the students, and the students are nervous, and they're sending me emails, and they're, they're, they're calling me, and, and, and they say, look, uh, 
could you let me know my parents are calling, I'm in trouble, and so on. So there's a lot of anxiety on that side. Anxiety is a no-no, it's not good. On the other hand, I grade the papers. Now, I am the one who's going to be suffering in this, right? My wife is very agreeable. She says, look, do it first, and then we'll go to the movies some other year. And uh, I, so, so, we, so, so, so I say, yeah, this is going to relieve a lot of anxiety among the students. The ones that get good grades, they'll be very happy, and they'll be happy sooner rather than later. Okay? And so on. So I try to assess the happiness factor. And it turns out that the happiness factor is such, I would say in this case, reasonably predictably, that I should really stay home and grade the papers. That's the end of it, right? Okay, so that would be the right action. It would be the wrong action for me to be fishing around uh, for fun going to the movies. Okay? It's a, it's a harmless example, but part of my life. Any question on that? All right, so, so now, but, but here is the difficulty. There are pleasures and satisfactions that follow quickly upon my action. There are pleasures and satisfactions that follow way down the road. Even more important, there are dissatisfactions and unhappinesses and great deal of displeasure that is created way down the road, which I'm not figuring because I can't exactly foresee at the present time. All right, so how do I take into account the short term and the long term? And Mill says something like this. You know, basically, morality consists in looking seriously at the long term. Anybody can snatch a little pleasure at the moment. That's called drug addiction. Right? You, 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 you don't feel good, pop a pill. Uh, you feel good immediately, or almost immediately. At least you feel better. Uh, what does that mean down the road? You might get addicted to it. You will... I'm going to kill myself on this thing, I know. Uh, you, you will get addicted to it. You will feel miserable in the long run. Uh, all kinds of bad things happen when you commit yourself to things that, are, that become habits. So, how do I make sure that I feel the urgency, the importance of the long term as much as I feel the temptation of the short term? How do I do it? You with me? You see, you see the point? Look, we, we face this every day. Every day. And part of the trouble, of course, is that as we face it, we face uncertainty, unpredictability. How do we know what will come? I mean, you're... Uh, there, there, there is this bill, the so-called Obamacare bill that was passed, and whatever you think of it is not the issue. The issue is, can we predict what its consequences will be? Uh, people are saying, yes, we can. Actually, it'll turn out that we hadn't the foggiest idea as to what really will follow from this. Most of the time, all kinds of unforeseeable consequences flow from anything that we do, and certainly anything that's done on a large scale. Okay? So how do we make decisions in the teeth of this kind of uncertainty? How do we do it? Well, you do it in fear and trembling. You do it worrying about, about things. You, you can't be held responsible for anything more, Mill says. can't be held responsible for anything more than the best you can in predicting what will happen. The important thing is that you calculate as carefully as you can. And that calculation will hopefully give you the right action, or at least come close to giving you the right action. All right? Okay. Any, any question? If it's unclear, you know, if you disagree, that's okay. If it's unclear, that's not okay. All right? So the happiness of the society is what, what this is all about. The happiness of every human individual. That's a wonderful ideal absolutely splendid ideal. But there's also an ideal that goes against it. You might say it's the ideal of the elite. Here everybody counts, and in Mill's other book on liberty, it looks like he'd like everybody to count, 
But in the end, only very exceptional people count. Because those exceptional people develop personalities and individualities which are unique. Actually, let me tell you that Mill says in, in On Liberty, if you want to read that, it's a magnificent book, in section 3, Mill says this, he says, what we really want is eccentricity in people. <laughs> eccentricity. Now, eccentricity is a wonderful idea so long as it's not damaging. Eccentricity is really finding your own way in the world. Uh, putting your own stamp on your own life making your own decisions about who you're going to be and how you react to things, rather than following, as he says, ape-like, following what other people do or following what the society wants you to do. So what you have out of this is a defense of individuality and a defense, a really magnificent defense of liberty for all. What does liberty mean? Well, it's very simple. Liberty is the ability to do what you want to do. All right? So I am free because I can walk. You're sitting. You can't walk right now. Right? So you're not free in quite the, quite the same extent. I can walk this way. I can walk that way. Right? And, and I feel free when I do that. I swear to you. I feel so free when I do that. It's wonderful. I, I can't stand in one place. That's liberty. Now, now it's also liberty when I say to my parents at a certain age, whatever that may be, 18 or 51, uh, I, when I say to them, look, that's your view, and that's how you want me to lead my life, but that's not how I do it. I make up my own mind about my life. Because, why? Because it's my life. It's my life. I will have to bear the consequences. So if I bear the consequences, I want to make the decisions. I can do anything I want so long as, this is liberty, so long as, so long as I really want to do it. If I really want to do it, I can do it. So it's a combination of desire and ability. Desire drives us. Right? Ability limits us. We can't do everything that we want to do. Huh? I, I, I wanted to be a philosopher. I'd also love being a physicist. Well, I'm not, I, I can't do both of them. I probably couldn't be a physicist anyway in the first place. I'm weak on math. But, but, uh, but you know, it would be nice to have. And I, by the way, what's wrong with being a doctor also? And while you're at it, a lawyer. And you know, I'd love to do all these things, but I can't, so I've got to choose. And I've got to choose wisely, or at least intelligently, if not wisely. And in choosing, I will bear the consequences so you don't have to say anything about it. You don't have a say in it. Okay? No grown person should be held back in their own creation of themselves. You might put it this way. Uh, we, 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 we create our children. Right? Number one, biologically. Number two, you teach them. From early childhood, you try to get them into the right habits. You've you got to give them the right values. Uh, you do all of that. At some point, we've got to step back and say, you're on your own. Right? You know, your, your parents, you know what I'm talking about. You know how difficult that is. Because yeah? you know that they're not going to do it right. <laughs> you just know that. Which means you don't trust yourself. Trust yourself that you've given them the right values. And they go out there and they do it. And why shouldn't they? You know, it's their lives. They'll take over from us. If we don't trust them, you know, we really goofed. We really goofed. So Mill says, at some stage... Kids have got to take over their own lives. And they've got to make their decisions, suffer for it. So, now, does that mean I can do anything? Can I go up to you and start beating up on you? Well, Mel says, no, 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 no. There's something that I call, he says, the harm principle. My liberty stops when I cause harm to anybody. The moment I cause harm, it's no good. So the state, the government, right, the police are justified in stopping me in my liberty when I'm hurting somebody else or interfering with their liberty. Right? Okay? So there's a limit to liberty. The limit is a very real one 
and that is the function of government and the legitimate function of government and the main legitimate function of government as far as Mill is concerned. The main legitimate function of government to make sure that we are not harmed by others. Not harmed by others who are elsewhere in the world, maybe uh, uh, they're jihadis uh, or no, the Mongolians are going to attack Kansas City any day now. We've got to be sure that this doesn't happen that people are protected, but also protected from each other. Now, this is, this is a wonderful ideal, but it's very difficult to embody. Because really there are two sources of oppression in our lives, Mill says. One of them is government, when government doesn't do the job that it's supposed to do. Government is supposed to protect us from each other, but not protect each of us from herself or himself, right? We don't want to be protected. I, I don't want to be protected from others. I just don't. I, I'm sorry. I don't want to be protected from myself. I do want to be protected from others. <laughs> Small slip. Uh, I, I don't want to be protected from myself because I make decisions uh, that may be harmful to me. So long as I make those decisions and know that it might be harmful to me and, and I'm taking a chance, you know, I go to Vegas and bring money with me and I'm going to gamble and I know I'm going to lose the money or at least there's a good chance, but I'm an idiotic optimist and, and I say, uh, no, I'm going to make money at this, right? Does government have a right to stop me from that? No way. It's my money. It's my idiocy, right? I don't want to be protected from myself. I want to be protected from others, and that's, that's very important. But, the, but there the issue is something really serious, and that is, how do I know what counts as harm? Right? It's, it's, very, it's very easy to say, the moment I harm anybody, government can step in and stop me, because I don't have a right to harm anybody, although I have a right to harm myself. But now... What counts as harm? Now, everybody knows that physical harm is harm, right? So if, if somebody runs me down at 110 miles an hour, you know, I was just walking across 21st, which I do very frequently, and some of these cars coming in, on 21st, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, right there near the Baker Building, they come at 110 miles an hour, and they really try to hit me. And, and, and I, you, you haven't seen a man jump like I do, when I see one of those guys coming down. Uh, so, so I know that's harm. If, if, they were, if, if one of those cars were to flatten me, that would be serious. But now suppose I say to somebody, you really are an ass. Suppose I say that. Now that is impolite. That is nasty. Uh, should I be arrested for that? Well, you know, there, there are remarkable codes that, that universities have instituted lately, actually a few years back, so-called speech codes. And, and you're familiar with one of them, I'm sure one of these cases from Univers University of Pennsylvania where uh, some girls uh, were uh, at one o'clock in the morning very loud outside a guy's uh, dorm window and, um, and they were carrying on and they were laughing and they were being happy. And this guy woke up and he was mad as hell. He opened the window and said, you water buffaloes, get away from here. I don't know why water buffaloes, but <laughs> they took umbrage at this. And they said, water buffaloes, we're not. Uh, and uh, reported this to, uh, to the authorities at Penn. And uh, the guy was booted because he called some people water buffaloes. And you say, come on, these people haven't read Mills on Liberty. I mean, for heaven's sakes. So you call somebody a water buffalo. I mean, it's obvious that they were not. I mean, you know, it's not like that. So, so it was a case of mistaken identity. I mean, when you gave the example of the fellow standing there with saying to his parents, or yeah. saying to your parents, I can't you know, I want to do what I want to do. What if the parents see that he wants to go gamble in Las Vegas and they, they're trying to pay his college? Do they not have a right? They have a right to, as Mill says, plead with him, talk with him, try to convince him. In other words, use rational means of persuasion. But not things like, uh, we'll disinherit you, 
we're going to have somebody beat you up in Vegas. Uh, we, uh, we, we will never talk to you again. Yeah, these things are. Just, you know, talk to them, try to put sense in his head. Some people only learn by their own experience. Some people don't learn even by their own experience, right? So, so you, you say, look, if you, if you got to try this, go with a little bit of money and see how much you make, right? But, but uh, it, it'd be pretty clean that he'll come home without a penny. Uh, but he will have had a good time, right? Will this... Will this be self-reinforcing? Probably not. John, yes, sir. Can you tell us the source of that conversation we, over here? We don't oh, you can't hear you? You can't hear me? We can hear you. Oh, so sorry. So sorry. Uh, the question was, or the comment was, what do you do? I, I will repeat the questions. What do you do with a child of yours who is no longer a child? But is in a position where he wants to or she wants to do something idiotic like take all his money and go to Vegas and gamble. And, and, and my comment to that is, this, it's, it's lamentable that that might happen, but you've got all your persuasive powers about you to try to convince them that they really shouldn't do that. Not a good, not a good idea. All right? Yes, sir. Why oh, yes, ma'am. Wait till the end for questions. Why can't we wait till the end? <laughs> you know, I never like to wait for the end. Um, I think that it's important to ask questions as they occur when they relate to clarity and uh, and a serious objection but but obviously we don't want to open this to the floor in such a way that I won't have a chance to talk (laughs) yes ma'am Right. Committed suicide. Um, can you address that in terms of harm and... That's a toughie. Uh, this is, let, let me tell you what the question is or the, or the comment. Uh, there was this case, I believe at Rutgers, I may be wrong about that, Rutgers, of a roommate who obviously knew that his roommate was gay. And so the roommate rigged up a uh, television camera uh, and, the, and, and left. And so the roommate then invited uh, a fellow gay uh, and uh, the two of them did whatever they did. And this is on camera. And then, of course, you can imagine what delight it was for all the friends of these people to be watching this guy uh, in these compromising positions. The guy was so embarrassed that he committed suicide and died. Now, um, number one, it's a clear case of interference. I mean, it's a clear case of interference on the part of the person who rigged the TV camera. I mean, we have a right to privacy. And it's understood that if you're my roommate and you leave, then I can do in the room what I want. It's understood. And if he happens to come back early without having rigged the camera, he happens to be back early, uh, he knocks on the door, and you quit doing what you're doing, right? Uh, it might just be the case that some of us have done things like this in the dorm, even if not uh, on a, a gay basis. Uh, you know, you, somebody comes in, you quit kissing, or whatever. Uh, but this person obviously wanted to cause harm. So now that leads back directly to the question of what is harm. Uh, in a way, embarrassment is not harm. It's just unfortunate. But when embarrassment reaches a level where the person feels obliged to commit suicide, then it's a very serious harm. Right? And, and, and this is this, I mean, you can say, well, the person was too sensitive. Uh, I, I would say that it's reasonable to suppose that Finding pictures of oneself in compromising positions all over the campus is not oversensitivity. It's not a matter of oversensitivity. Now, I don't know what action is being taken by the university administration against the perpetrator, but he is going to... Can you imagine living 
with yourself, if you're a sensitive human being, and say, I did this, and it was a stupid thing to have done, but I thought it was clever, and, and a human being died as a result of this, walking around with that? Whew, I wouldn't like that. So, clearly a violation of uh, the harm principle. Well, he ought not to have done that. Let me go on about harm for another minute. Um, there are forms of harm uh, that are very difficult, very difficult to focus on and capture and punish. The, 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 the kind of harm, for instance, uh, when you go to Kroger and, and you know, Kroger and, and the other grocery stores are rigged for children in such a way that it's devilish. It's nothing but devilish. Here is this little kid. And as you check out, and sometimes you have to line up, there is a wall of candy on two sides. And this little guy is looking up, and it's, it's candy all the way to the sky. Right? And so uh, the kid says, understandably, I want some, Mom. Right? And this goes on, no, no, we don't buy that. No, it's bad for you. You know, all kinds of excuses. Your teeth will rot in your head, and so on. Uh, and, and the kid persists because he's a smart, persistent kid. And the mom at this point, I've seen this, grabs the kid by the hand and jerks him so that he's actually flying through the air. <laughs> I, I thought at the time the arm will detach. There's no question about it. It's going to detach. And now, this is harm, right? But who is going to step in and say, look, ma'am, you do this one more time and I'll rearrange your face? You, you, you can't do that, right? Because somehow we've got this idea that a little kid is the property of the parents. That the parents really have a right to do with a kid what, uh, what they want. A very unhappy thing. But how do, you, how, how do you protect the kid this way? Now, if it rises to the level of beatings and so on of, of, of the child, or starving the kid as sometimes you see, if it rises to that level, the neighbors can say, call the police, this has got to stop. But there are lots of small ways of harming people uh, which are difficult to catch. Uh, consider some case that you bring up from your memory, arbitrarily if you wish, uh, when you were in first grade or second grade or something, when you feel a great indignity had been done you by the teacher. If you don't if you can't think of anything like this, let me tell you, you are very lucky. <laughs> People go around carrying this in their heads as to what happened in grade two. Right? And I was made to stand in the corner or whatever. Is that harm? Well, I think so, but you can't go in and arrest all the teachers. Right? You can't do that. So th there are problems here. There are problems with the idea of what counts as harm. Physical, yes. Psychological, I don't know. Emotional, maybe better not. And why not? Because, remember, it's so easy to fake it. It's so easy to control other human beings by means of my saying, if you do that, it just will destroy your grandmother. Well, you know, grandma ought to be more hardy than that. <laughs> yeah. So that's the harm principle. Now, uh, what's important about the harm principle? What's important is that uh, it has, it opens the door. That's the best way to put it. It opens the door to unfettered examination, rational examination, and rational discussion of any topic whatsoever. Now, the, the idea of censorship, which is a, an idea that we spent I mean, we in the West spent somewhere in the neighborhood of six or seven hundred years to get over. And I mean that seriously. I, you couldn't say certain things because the powers that be would punish you for that. You can't, you can't say things. You could die for some of the things that you might want to say. No censorship. It's inappropriate, Mill says. It's inappropriate ever to stop a human being from inquiring about the truth. And here's the reasons he gives. One, because no one really knows what the truth is. And watch out the person who says, I know. Right? It's faking it. It's faking it. 
we, we, we live in the face of uncertainty, unavoidably so. So if we live that way, uh, nobody knows the truth. How can I tell somebody, you can't examine that? Because, you know, it might harm you. Well, look, if it harms you, it harms you. But you should be able to say it. So examination of the truth, partly because no one knows the truth, as I say, and you might find the truth. Partly because, for the most part, Mill says, most of what we know are half-truths. And some of us get along with quarter-truths. And maybe sometimes an eighth. Right? Uh, so how, how can I say that you, sh- you mustn't say those things or you shouldn't publish that thing or you shouldn't discuss this topic because this is dangerous or inappropriate and so on? I mean, we used to have these taboos about sex. Uh, now, uh, the young people that I, uh, uh, I understand like to do the opposite of what we did. We were extremely quiet about these things and they're extremely loud about these things. Uh, they, uh, you know, if you l- go to the uh, social, um, uh, what is this called? What are they Facebook. called? The, Facebook. Huh? Facebook. Yeah, but I mean, it, they're called the social interaction, not social interaction. That's some, huh? Network. Social network size. Oh, thank you. Uh, you know, you, you can be privy to the most uh, uh, embarrassing uh, and, and most intimate thoughts and actions of, of young people, and they feel that this is a wonderful thing to do. At least my students feel that way. Okay, well, if you feel that way, that's all right, but, uh, uh, you know, I, it's not my style. Uh, maybe not your style. But the point is that there are an incredible number of things that we can do um, and ought to do in, f- in finding out what goes on in the world. But we need to know also when it's inappropriate, uh, somewhat inappropriate in any case, inappropriate by one's own decision, not by governmental decision, but by my own decision it's inappropriate to air that aspect of my life. Okay, you with me? So, there's the issue of half-truths. There's the issue of, of examination of truth. And then, uh, not just examination of truth, but the, uh, but, but, but the reality that we don't know what the truth is. But most important, perhaps, is that Mill says there are some truths that we all accept, and we accept simply because of habit. There are certain beliefs that we have that have we don't really know why we, why we believe them. That I, I, we, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, look, you, you go to church and you say the Nicene Creed. Right? Now, some of you might not say the Nicene Creed, but yet suppose you do. Uh, you say to yourself, what am I saying? What's this mean? Well, I believe it, but what's it mean to believe it? It's kind of like a rote. Y- you... You see what I'm saying? It, it's not something that, I mean, the, 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 the sermon is supposed to enlighten us and kind of bring it, bring it home. Uh, that's not the sermons I hear. Uh, uh, no bring home. Uh, what, what you've got, what you've got to do is to understand that beliefs need vivacity. I love this point. That if you believe things merely because Somebody told you to believe it or make, because you've always believed it. That's the great thing. I've always believed that. Well, if you always believe that, you probably don't believe it well enough now. And the reason you don't believe it is because it's no, there's, there's no life to that belief. The only way that beliefs can be alive is by, have, by being challenged. You know, when you, somebody challenges your belief, then you say, Phew! Let me see if I can find some reasons why I believe this. And you'll be amazed how difficult it is to find a reason to believe these things. Whatever they may be. But that's what makes you a better person. That's what makes your belief a more vivacious one. That's what makes a difference to your life. Right? Your belief should make a difference to your life and not, should not be just a rote acceptance of things. Okay, yeah. There are truths that there are some 
we all there may, be, there may be, a question is, are there truths that we all accept? I would say it would be better to, to, to put it this way. Uh, there, are, there are some beliefs that all of us or many of us share. But that they're true or not is not clear. Right? Uh, for a while, everybody accepted that the earth was flat. That's not a fiction. That's, that's, that's really true. I said, of course, you know, don't get near the edge. You'll fall off. We don't believe that anymore. I mean, there are any number of things that we used to believe that it turns out it's better not to believe because all the evidence seems to point in the other direction. I still have difficulty, this is a, this is a personal confession, I still have difficulty in believing that people in Australia are not walking with their heads hanging down. <laughs> Perfect perfectly obvious that that's what they do. I mean, look, you look at the globe and, you know, and I'm on top and they are on the bottom. How they don't fall off, I don't know. Must be strong gravity in Australia. Okay? All right. So, so let, me, let, me, let me now talk a little bit about how this relates to us, this liberty issue relates to us. Mill says there are things called victimless crimes. Uh, they're crimes because the government says, or Congress says, or somebody says, uh, somebody in authority says, um, you can't do this, and if you do do this and we apprehend you, you're going to go to jail. Like what? Well, smoking marijuana. Now, now you know, uh, I'm unable to, I, I don't myself do it. I, 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 I'm devoted to martinis uh, <laughs> and to coffee. But, but lots of people manage to have, in fact, some extremely distinguished people that I know, uh, and some di very distinguished people whom I don't know, uh, had uh, smoked marijuana and uh, lived to tell the tale. Uh, one of them describes it by saying, you know, just kind of gives you a sense of... <laughs> now, I, I, maybe not. I have no idea. But, but, you know, you recover from it after a while. And after the recovery, you just have a pleasant memory. And it's not clear, except if you look at the history of legislation concerning marijuana, it's not clear why people can't do this. Heard a radio program on this uh, just yesterday, how uh, in a variety of states, mainly on the West Coast, but also in Michigan, interestingly enough, uh, mar medical marijuana, put medical in quotation marks, is now available. And of course, the, the, the folks that, that, that fight against it the most viciously are the cigarette people, because this would be competition, right? Oh, how about that? Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, why would we have legislation about it? Well, it, th there's a story to this. There were a couple of young people who uh, committed a murder in Florida back in the 1930s, and they also smoked marijuana. Congress, in its wisdom, immediately jumped into action and said, and, and listen to the logical fallacy. It is, they smoked marijuana, they killed, therefore they smoked marijuana, and that caused them to kill. Well, the, the one thing that marijuana doesn't cause people to do is kill. Be senseless, yes, but kill, no. So, so we have laws about this. This is a victimless crime. Who's being hurt? Now, suppose you say, I don't want to smell it. Well, if you don't want to smell it, don't go near McGill dorm on campus. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you don't, you don't want to smell it, then, then when we could tell people, do it in your own room. That's okay. Well, all right. Let me give you another example. This is insane. Masturbation. 28 states in the nation criminalized it. So if you're caught masturbating in certain states, I will not tell you which ones, if you're caught masturbating, you are to be prosecuted and possibly put in jail. Right? Now, don't do it. <laughs> you're, you're okay in Tennessee, so you can do it. <laughs> 
now, 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 think about it for a minute. For the love of Pete, my God. Can, can you imagine? First of all, my first question is, if you're masturbating, who's going to turn you in? <laughs> this is really, this is insane. But, but we have these victimless crimes that the state, in its wisdom, says, well, you, know, you mustn't do this and you mustn't do that. Did you see what Senator DeMint proposed yesterday? No, tell me. What did Senator DeMint propose? Well, he wants... Uh, Masturbation no school, for all? No school, no school teachers that are cohabiting with people they're not married to. Oh. They, they should be banned from teaching. No homosexuals, no this, no that. And I think there's something about masturbation in there also. My God, we're, we're, we're not going to have any teachers. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 idea, the idea is that, uh, it, uh, you're reporting this, uh, the idea is that if you are cohabiting with somebody to whom you're not married, if you happen to be gay, and if, what's the third one? Uh, oh, masturbate. How can I forget that? Uh, if, you, if you're a masturbator, <laughs> uh, you can't be a teacher. I mean, it's, it's actually comical. If it weren't so serious, it would be funny. Uh, you know, look, I'm not saying that some of these things may not be bad for you, right? Uh, I, I know some. I knew some kids over my career at Vanderbilt who really had a lot of trouble doing their work because they smoked pot. Uh, because the, every time they had a little pressure uh, to get something done, they just went to pieces. So I, I got to have something that relieves that. Well, they smoked a little pot, and the result was that uh, they were sent away. All right. So at, this can be very bad. But the other side of it is that I remember a time, a uh, good many years ago, when uh, one of my students, who happened to be a philosophy major, uh, rushed in and said, uh, they're, they're coming to get all the drugs out of the dorms, which was a false alarm. Uh, he said, I'm broke now because I bought all this stuff and I had to flush it down the commode, <laughs> which he did. And this person is a very distinguished attorney in Knoxville at the present time. <laughs> you know, so, so maybe it doesn't kill you. Uh, maybe, it, maybe it isn't so bad after all, right? Okay. Not, not a recommendation you do it. Just, I'm just saying, you know, we, we play things up to be more sometimes than they really are. Uh, victimless crimes. Uh, all kinds. Now, I'm not talking about victimless crimes. I, I, I don't, don't call the following actions victimless crimes. That's what I mean to say. Uh, you go to a bar and a lot of people are smoking cigarettes. Right? Now, if you go to a bar and a lot of people are smoking cigarettes, the likelihood is that you don't have to light up. You just inhale. <laughs> and, and that can be very harmful. Now, this doesn't happen anymore. So the state at some point said, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you really have to smoke. Now, at Vanderbilt, we had until this year uh, a rule by which uh, you could not smoke in any of the buildings. But you could stand outside and smoke. So the result was that I, I, I'm in Furman Hall and I'd have to go like this to, to get into the building. Uh, bec now, now they can't even do it outside the building except in, in very specially designated areas. Okay, so look, I can see the point of that. Because that's harmful. But, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're more likely to get lung cancer uh, if you inhale a lot of secondhand smoke uh, than you're likely to get anything if you inhale uh, your own marijuana fumes. Mill puts it this way. He says, if you're afraid that people are going to use poisons to do each other in, does that justify the state saying poisons cannot be bought? And he says absolutely no. He comes up with the idea of pre-appointed evidence. Pre-appointed evidence is, is, the, is this notion that uh, here you are, you're wanting to get some poison. For what reason? You know, you got rats in the belfry. Um, you got, uh, you, uh, you, you want to get that. You should be able to get it. But before you get it, or as you get it, you're supposed to sign for it. 
so that if your wife turns up dead of uh, some uh, you know, poisoning, uh, the first thing they're going to do is, let's just look and see, have you signed for some poison? All right? In other words, we're going to protect people. But protecting people is not the same as protecting them from themselves so they can't do what they want to do. Pre-appointed evidence is a, is a beautiful idea. It enables you to do much more of what you want. Let me stop for a minute. Uh, we've got time for a question or two. Yes, sir. Ah, okay, this is a great question. Let me, let me repeat the question. In our own terms, would I call Mill a libertarian? Uh, no. Uh, there's an interesting, you know, words change their meaning over time. Mill is a classical liberal, which is the exact opposite of a current liberal. A, cur a, current, liberal, a current liberal is a person who tends to look to the state for solutions to our problems. All right, social problems. Uh, Mill looks to individuals for the solution of social problems and wants the state to stay out. So that's the difference between liberal in the 19th century and liberal in the 20th century. Okay? Anybody else? Yeah. Is there any uh, significance to the sequence in which these two major books of, of Mill were, were published? Uh, is there any? Right, right. Uh, is there any significance to the sequence of these books? No, I don't think so. Uh, the, uh, the utilitarianism book was really written for a magazine. They wanted to know, what's this utilitarianism stuff? So he wrote it. On Liberty was a passion of his and of his wife's. And he credits Harriet Taylor, his wife, uh, with uh, many of the ideas in it. And that may well be true. Uh, although she died before the book was published. Uh, no, I think, I think the real love here is on liberty, and utilitarianism is more like, uh, uh, look, we all think this. Let me tell you what it is. Okay, yeah. Utilitarianism still mean the same thing? I'm sorry? Utilitarianism, same thing then as now? Uh, util is utilitarianism the same then as it is now? The answer to that is yes, except we're, we've, we've, we've kind of chopped it up in little bits and made it so subtle it's almost ridiculous. Mill is head on, and he tells you what it is, and all the, the minute details of philosophical speculation are not there in Mill, which, of course, philosophers lament. They say, why, why isn't there a lot of irrelevant who are here? Uh, and, and, and the answer is because he hits the really important points, which is the social good and how it relates to individuals. Where would Mill come down on assisted suicide? Ah, right. Now, that's a very interesting question. Where would Mill come down on assisted suicide? Now, I've got to begin by telling you that he violates his own principle uh, in the following way. He says, you can do anything you want so long as you don't harm anybody else. You can harm yourself. And then he says, but you can't kill yourself. <laughs> there are two things you, can't, you don't have the liberty to do. Ah, I'm glad you raised that issue. One, you cannot sell yourself into slavery. Well, that's not, I'm not worried about that because <laughs> nobody made an offer. Uh, the second one is you can't kill yourself. Now, why, why, why would he think that you can't kill yourself? Here's the reason he gives. Not a good reason. He says... It's irreversible. Well, it's certainly true. But look, if you get married, that's irreversible. Sure, you can get divorced, but that will not undo the fact that you've married somebody, right? Every single act that we perform is irreversible. Right? We did it. That's the end of it. So su suicide, by his own principle, should be permitted. And the state has no business in sustaining your life. That's what he ought to say. He didn't say that. That kind of distorts what he would likely say to assisted suicide. Because if suicide is not okay, then surely assisted suicide is not okay. And particularly is it not okay because two people are involved. So what Dr. Kevorkian does hurts you. 
But even there coming, even there you've got to say, Dr. Kevorkian helps me, but I agree to die at his hands. Actually, not at his hands, but at my hands. He just rigs, rigs the machinery. Well, he doesn't now because he's in jail, but that's what he did. So, and, and Mill always says, it says again and again, mutually agreed things, whatever they may be, mutually agreed actions are permissive, permissible because no one is involved but the two contracting parties. So I think he is violating his own principle. He, he, let me say one more thing. Uh, if, when, you're reading, when you're reading this book, you'll find a remarkable comment early on. He says the following. Um, Liberty is only or should only be available for people in civilized countries. Wait a minute. He says people who are in nations that are fairly early in human development and children should be protected from themselves. That really, ooh, that, that gives, gives me the heebies. Now remember that he was an official of the East India Company. The East, the East India Company ran India. And it was easy to think that even though this is a country of very, very great um, depth of culture, right? A great depth of culture, great religions and so on, it would be very, very easy to say, well, those are savages. We at Oxford are the folks. And, uh, uh, and that's, in, in effect, what Mill says. What, another slip. Uh, I think he would be much better with that, this one paragraph that he puts in. And even with children, you know, you know and I know that children are capable of making decisions about a lot of things. Our daughter made decisions about what she would wear at age two and better not get in the way. And it's perfectly okay because that's how they learn to make decisions. You give them a chance. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, yes, they were, and uh, repeat the question. Sorry, uh, what about slavery in the U.S. Even while uh, he was writing these books, uh, it was a it was a reality that slavery was going on here. He is absolutely vehement against it. He writes a book called "The Subjection of Women," in which in which he attacks the role that women had been relegated to by men. Uh, he feels that uh, women had been done a great injustice, uh, that they're just as capable as men, uh, that, they are, that, they, that, that they really have to be allowed their liberty. For instance, uh, many women couldn't vote. Uh, in, in many places, women couldn't own property. Unheard of. And Mill comes right down just as hard as he can against it. It's, the Subjection of Women is a very great book about women's liberation before there was women's liberation. Right? So uh, what about uh, the U.S. And, uh, uh, and, and slavery? No go. He's against it. Not only is he against that, but he is against what he sees as the persecution of Mormons. He says, why is it the state's business how many people I marry? If I like to marry them, and they like to marry me, have at it. Now, we have this idea of monogamous marriage as somehow in the state interest. You know, if we had grown up with polygamous marriage, it would be in the state interest. Anything that's a stable background to human practices is in the interest of the state. So, so you know, we, we, have, we have all these remarkable beliefs. And, and, and these beliefs are optional. They're contingent. Um, did I say too much for you? <laughs> <laughs> now that you were talking about how he felt like a, in less developed countries, people needed to be protected, so I wondered how he felt about slaves in the United States have become... The, the, the way to look at that, I think he would say, is not just from the standpoint of what it's like to be a slave, and do justice to the people who ought not to be owned by others. They're not property. But also, from the other, st from the other standpoint, 
Right? The other standpoint is uh, how holding slaves and treating and mistreating slaves is an awful thing for the slave owner. Right? Now, it may not seem that way because you can tell them to do things that you'd hate to do. But in reality, treating human beings that way is not going to be limited to your slaves. It's going li- to spread to other folks. Somebody, yes? Yeah, a quick uh, clarification uh, about the, there's liberals and there's liberals. But a libertarian is yeah. actually against government interfering in life. Right, but a libertarian would like to have as little government as possible and ideally nil. Now, Mill knows better than that. I mean, you know, without government, this would be chaos. Without rules, we would be constantly at each other. Uh, you, 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 you know, we're, we're not holy. We have to have some power held over us that says you can do this, but you can't do that. I would like to be protected that way. And that's government's job. Uh, so, yes, he is a liberal of the old school, classical liberal, but not a libertarian. Yes. Did he have any thoughts on war? Warfare. I mean, is that moral? Uh, is is well, warfare maybe is war, is warfare moral according to Mill? It depends on the war, right? Because remember, he believes in the rightness of action being dependent on consequences. And what are the consequences of war? Sometimes they are wonderful, sometimes they are horrible, right? The the, the consequences of the Second War. Uh, getting rid of Mussolini and Hitler wasn't so bad. I mean, a lot of people died, and that was terrible. But imagine if Hitler had run the U.S., right? So, uh, or, or Japan had run the U.S., right? Yeah, we'd be driving Toyotas. <laughs> Just... So we won the war and lost the war, right? <laughs> okay, I got a couple more minutes. Anybody? Uh, yes. The second source of oppression. I'm sorry. The second source of oppression. Oh, the second source of oppression. I didn't. I, I, oh, so glad you raised that. The second source of oppression is not the government, but society. He, he, he says that there is so much readiness on the part of people to tell you what to do. Right? The idea of leaving others alone is so difficult to achieve. It's a great virtue, leaving others alone. Not telling people what to do. Have you ever been in a doctor's office where you say to your husband or wife, you know, it, I really have this pain, and that's why you're going to the doctor, and the person sitting next to you overhears this? and says, here's what you take. Uh, and, and hauls out uh, some medication and ready to share it with you. You know, and God knows what it'll do to you. It might kill you. But they're ready. They are ready to tell you how to raise your children, how to cure your diseases, uh, how you run your life, what your, what your house ought to look like. No. Why do you have this rug here? Huh? That kind of thing. I mean, people love running each other's lives. That's a source of oppression. Because you can't keep on saying, get lost, get lost, get lost. (laughs) You can't keep on saying that, although you really want to say that. And it would be appropriate to say that, but they'd hate your guts. Yes, ma'am. How would he feel about evangelical Christianity? evangelical Christianity? So long as the belief, the internal belief of people propels them to do things, that's perfectly fine. But you know, uh, if somebody wants to shut your door, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking now not, of ev- not about evangelical Christians, but I'm thinking about uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, you, they come to the door and bless them, they really act on their beliefs. But you open the door and the foot's in, you know? And, and now let's talk about going to hell if you're not. Uh, one of us. Uh, you know, that's just, that's a nuisance. That's a nuisance. It's a tasteless nuisance. Right? Uh, but it's not something I can, wait a minute, I'm going to call 911 and have you hauled out. So, so act on your beliefs, but if you're a decent person, you'll back off when people will say, I've got my own beliefs, 
and just as you want to convert me, I'd like to convert you. I, I, my, my, my ultimate defense against uh, people who were visiting me at one point before I was married, uh, they really thought that I would be a, uh, I, could, I could become a Jehovah's Witness. And they said, you know, if you're not, that you will burn in hell. And I said, that's probably a proper fate for me. <laughs> Thank you very much.